it's astounding to note that the epistles of the New Testament clearly give us a before and after story. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle John never tired in declaring to the early church that they'd been saved from death and raised to life. This is especially true in two passages that I want to read. In the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the fourth verse, and then the first four verses of 1 John. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that you at that time were without Christ, being aliens of the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. And listen to the Apostle John as he gives evidence of a first-hand relationship with Christ. No borrowed creed for John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing this to you so that your joy might be full. Well, is it? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, an awesome thing it is when we read the New Testament to be confronted with life and death and to know that you have come among us in order to save us, not only from our sins, but to save us to live now and for eternity. Bless the interpretation of the words that we've read and grip us by the power of your Spirit so that we might know what we believe, whom we believe. Amen. What do agnostics have that Christians don't have? Before I answer, allow me to define terms. The word agnostic, A, without, gnosis, or gnosia, knowledge, means without knowledge. 
To be an agnostic is to be one who claims not to know, who faces the questions and concerns about life and faith and God and eternity by simply saying, I'm not convinced yet. I don't know. So you probably are wondering, what in the world does an agnostic have that Christians do not have? Well, for openers, an agnostic is independent. No one to report to. Life is a courtroom without a judge. An agnostic has freedom. There's no accountability. An agnostic can keep a smokescreen around his or her heart and mind with a multitude of questions so that he or she never has to face the ultimate issues or make a decision. An agnostic has something else. An agnostic has no place to go in times of trouble. No way to deal with the panic of life. No answers to the deepest, soul-searching questions of life. No way to die with confidence or live forever. Well, agnostics do have something going for them, don't they? Phillips Brooks, near the end of his life, was not feeling well, and the doctors told him to rest and not have any of his friends around for a while. Phillips Brooks was the great preacher of Boston, well known, of equal fame, but from a different point of view, was Robert Ingersoll, the famous agnostic. When it was made known through the papers that Phillips Brooks could not see anyone, Ingersoll, with his uh, traditional pushy manner, decided that he should be the one to see Dr. Brooks. And so he sent his message through, and Dr. Brooks said, yes, I will see him. When he came in the door, into the room where Phillips Brooks was in bed, the first thing Ingersoll said was, Dr. Brooks, why were you willing to see me and unwilling to see all of your friends? <laughs> Dr. Brooks responded, Oh, my dear Robert, I know I will see all of my friends in eternity. but I'm not sure that I'll see you. And that's the reason I wanted to see you today and explain to you why Jesus Christ is the answer. Amazing. The issue of the agnostic is the issue not of intellectual questions which cannot be answered but of answers that cannot be denied. The challenge before the agnostic is to respond. The method of the agnostic is to turn all of the intellectual questions of life into true and false. When for Jesus, the only legitimate response was yes, or no. It would be as if uh, I had a couple here and uh, we're performing a wedding service. And I said to the groom, do you take this woman to be your wedded wife? And he would say, true. <laughs> Jesus says to us, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Take up your cross and follow me. 
and we say true or false. The agnostic holds off the moment of commitment, and the issue is life or death. With robust audacity, the New Testament confronts us. Jesus came as the life, saying, in me is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And behind that claim was the clear understanding that he was the preexistent Christ through whom all things were made. He was the prevenient Christ sent into history before mankind was ready to reconcile human beings to himself. He was the living presence of God in our midst. In him was life, and his life was the light of men, said John. For him, to accept him was to receive life. To refuse to accept him was to deny life. And his followers heard his voice. The 25th verse of the fifth chapter of John, he made it very, very clear. Most assuredly, I say to you, the time is coming and now is when you shall hear the voice of the Son of Man. And you shall live. For Jesus Christ's mission was to bring us life, life now and life for eternity. It is not unusual then that those who were his followers made the life and death issue the central issue in their writings. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he made it very clear in that second chapter that the central issue was that the Christians had been raised from death into life. They had been dead in their sins and trespasses. And the two words that are used here for sin and trespass means that they had been dead in missing the mark and dead in heading the wrong direction. And because of the goodness and the grace of God, his love which could not be contained, he raised them out of death and lifted them up together and allowed them to dwell in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And how did it happen? The process is explained so clearly it cannot be denied. The condition of the Ephesians was that they were dead. Christ came to give them life. And how could they accept life? Very clearly, three things. For by grace you have been saved through faith. First is salvation, wholeness, healing, health, reconciliation to God, life now and life forever. That was the offer in and through Jesus Christ. And faith is the response to that, accepting for oneself the wonderful gift of salvation and receiving the grace that God offered. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, least anyone should boast. And then Paul goes on to describe what is the result. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. And the wonderful word that's behind we are his worksmanship is poema. We are his poem, a thing of beauty, a thing of symmetry, perfection. And he has come to call each of us so that he can work through us, in us, to make life all that it was meant to be. The central issue then is have we responded to receive what he did for us in the revelation of life, 
to accept what he offers us in the gift of his own life. For Christianity is life as Christ lived it, life as we live it in him, as recipients of his death and his resurrection. The Apostle John made it so clear in writing his first epistle that it was a first-hand relationship with Christ that was important, that was the source of life and hope, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon with our eyes and which our hands have handled, the very word of life. And then he goes on to suggest that that life from God, manifested in Christ, is the basis of life. Now, many people within the church have come to recognize that they were closet agnostics. As a matter of fact, a recent survey has discovered that one-fourth of regular church attenders in America have never made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that they could identify has anything to do with their everyday life. One-third of the mainline churches are identified as people who have never made a personal commitment to Christ. Fifty-three percent of the Roman Catholic Church in this survey is identified as never having made a personal commitment to Christ. And we better not be too uh, self-satisfied as evangelicals because in the survey, 14% of the mainline evangelicals had never made a personal commitment to Christ. The issue is commitment, for there is always a next step to be made. And it isn't so much the questions that we must get answered before we'll move on. It's the question of committing as much as we know of ourselves to as much as we know of Christ at this moment. Agnostics within the church are those who say, I simply don't know about aspects of the faith. I haven't made a decision yet. And so a person can say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but not come to grips with the fact that he's living now that he's able to do in and through us what he did as Jesus of Nazareth. To be filled with his Spirit is to be able to love as he loved, forgive as he forgave, heal as he healed, do miracles as he did them. Many of us say, well, I don't know about that. The Christ-filled life. Many contemporary Christians say, oh, isn't that just a little bit too emotional? and miss the power. So the question is, at what point has agnosticism, I don't know, I'm not going to get committed, affected you? The central issue of the baby busters and the baby boomers in America is the unwillingness to make a commitment. But I'm not so sure that uh, those of us in middle age and beyond uh, have given that much better an example because simply identifying the issues is one thing, but making a commitment to Christ and following him unreservedly is the central issue. It's a matter of life and death. Now, where are you in relation to Christ? He is here present in his power. What will you say to him? What will be your response when he says to you, you, come follow me. You, accept me as your Lord and Savior. You have been chosen, appointed, and called to be my disciple. Now come, follow me. What will be your decision? He says to those of you who have been locked on a plateau of uh, satisfaction with one stage of growth in the Christian life, you, I created you so that I might live in you. 
and I want to do through you exactly what I did. At what point have you held back and said, I don't know. I don't want to make a commitment that far. What would you be like if you made an unreserved commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord? It is a life and death issue. Not only how you will live now, but where you will spend eternity.